This module will focus on the basic biology of prokaryotes, which includes the bacteria as well as the archaea bacteria, or simply archaea. Let's begin with a brief mention of just a few relevant bacteria. Uh, so for example, Escherichia coli or E. coli, a very common bacterium. We have lots and lots of E. coli in our digestive tracts all the time, typically causing no harm whatsoever. There are, however, some strains of E. coli that are pathogenic. So these are the ones that are responsible for the occasional outbreak of food poisoning that you might hear about relating to undercooked ground beef. Bacillus thuringiensis, or simply Bt, this is a bacterium that produces a toxin that kills a variety of different types of caterpillars. The gene encoding for this toxic protein has been introduced to many crop plants, so essentially allows them to produce their own pesticides. You probably have heard about Bt before. Bacillus anthracis, this is simply the bacterium responsible for anthrax. Helicobacter pylori, or H. pylori, this is the bacterium responsible for many ulcers. It turns out, just within the past 15 years or so, we discovered that many ulcers are in fact caused by a bacterial infection. Also, there's a whole group of, of prokaryotes referred to as cyanobacteria, or blue-green algae. The blue-green algae, or the cyanobacteria, they hold an important uh, pivotal role uh, in the history of life on Earth, because these organisms are photosynthetic, and they produce oxygen as a byproduct, of course, of photosynthesis. The, so they radically changed our atmosphere. With the production of, of oxygen as a byproduct from photosynthesis in the cyanobacteria, that then paved the way for the origin and evolution of eukaryotes that undergo aerobic cellular respiration. General features of bacteria, well, bacteria are pretty much everywhere. From the depths of the ocean to the highest place on Earth, you're pretty much going to find prokaryotes all over the place. Typically, bacteria are quite small, so small you can't see them without a microscope. There are exceptions, however, if you notice the picture of the fruit fly here. Uh, what you see are a few cells located next to the fruit fly. Those are individual bacterial cells, so there are, in fact, some cells that are quite large that uh, are prokaryotes. Most prokaryotes are single-celled organisms. Most of these also have cell walls. Their chemical composition of the cell walls is different from the cell walls of plant cells and fungal cells and, and other organisms, as we'll see in a bit. And one of the hallmarks of prokaryotes is that they lack true membrane-bound organelles. So they don't have nuclei, they don't have chloroplasts, mitochondria, etc. We, all, of all the many, many species of prokaryotes that exist, we recognize essentially two different groups or two different domains. Namely, those prokaryotes we refer to as simply bacteria, or you might come across the term eubacteria, uh, and also those prokaryotes referred to as archaebacteria or archaea. They are, they are in many ways, they, they resemble one another quite, quite significantly, but there are enough molecular differences between these two groups that warrant their inclusion in two separate domains. All other organisms are, of course, included with the domain eukarya. This would include all eukaryotes, so things like proteasts, plants, animals, and fungi. Bacteria can thrive in many harsh environments. So we can talk about extremophiles in terms of those species that thrive in, in very harsh extreme conditions. So for example, there are some bacteria that thrive in very salty water. The concentration of salt is so high that it essentially kills everything else. Uh, but however, certain bacteria just thrive with no problem. Other bacteria can thrive in very hot environments or under very high pressures. Conditions that might be encountered at the bottom of the ocean. So we can talk about thermophiles, those bacteria that thrive in hot conditions, and barophiles, those bacteria that thrive under very high pressures. So the point is, many species of bacteria can thrive in harsh environments. In terms of the shape and structure of, of prokaryotes, we typically find bacteria in one of three different shapes. So for example, toward the top here, you see some cells that are spherical in nature. That's referred to as the cocci shape. Toward the middle, we see bacteria that are rod-shaped or bar-shaped. Those are bacilli. And finally, toward the bottom, we see bacteria that are spiral-shaped, referred to as spirilli. In addition to these shapes, we can identify fairly common arrangements of cells. So if we look first of all toward the middle, we see that these cells are arranged in a chain-like fashion. That's the strep arrangement. In contrast, the cells toward the top, 
are oriented in clusters. That's the staph arrangement. So quite often the names of bacteria reflect the shape and arrangement of the cells. So for example, Streptococcus pneumoniae. This is a bacterium that can cause pneumonia. Streptococcus referring to the fact that its cells are spherical, cocci, and in a strep arrangement. Strep. You also might have heard of MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Again, Staphylococcus referring to cells that are spherical in shape and arranged in clusters. What about the cell wall of bacteria? Well, it turns out that there's a, a fairly simple staining procedure that you can do if, if you're trying to, for example, identify an unknown bacterial sample uh, called the Gram stain. Of course, named after the person who first worked this out. But it's a, a simple staining procedure whereby after you're finished, your cells will either have a purple appearance or a red appearance, much like you see in the image here. So those purple colored cells are Gram positives whereas the red colored cells are gram negatives. So what's the difference between gram positive and gram negative bacteria? Well, gram positive bacteria, if we look at toward the, toward the middle panel here, we see schematically a representation of the basic cell wall structure. So just to get your bearings, here is the cell membrane. Exterior to that is the cell wall. And gram positive bacteria, the cell wall is a fairly thick layer of this carbohydrate referred to as peptidoglycan. On the other hand, gram-negative bacteria, they have a fairly thin layer of peptidoglycan, and exterior to that, they have yet another membrane. So it's this difference in cell wall structure between gram-positives and gram-negatives that not only result in the differential coloring that we see as a result of the gram stain, but also, of course, is highly relevant, especially if a person has a bacterial infection, because the antibiotic of choice will, of course, depend on whether you're dealing with a gram-positive or gram-negative bacterium. What about motility? It turns out that many species of bacteria, can, of, of bacteria can, in fact, move about their environment in several different ways. So for example, there are some bacteria referred to as spirochetes. So they have a spiral shape, much like you see in this bacterial cell here. Uh, a few examples are those bacteria that re are responsible for syphilis and Lyme disease. They essentially are cells that contract and relax over and over and over again. And as a result, they essentially corkscrew their way through their environment or they can corkscrew their way through living host tissue. So again, spirochetes move by contracting, relaxing, and essentially spiraling their way through their environment. In contrast, other bacteria actually produce flagella. Flagella, which of course can move about propelling the cells through their environment. Now what's interesting about bacterial flagella is that unlike flagella, uh, for example, of sperm cells, which essentially just whip back and forth, Bacterial flagella, they literally spin. Here we see a schematic representation of bacterial flagellar structure. So cell membrane, outer cell wall, and here's a flagellum embedded in this bacterial cell wall. What we have here essentially might be the only case in nature where we have a spinning wheel. So again, the, the point is that the bacterial flagella, uh, although yes, it's responsible for movement, its structure and mechanism of activity is largely different than the flagella that we find in eukaryotic organisms. In addition, there are some bacteria who have the ability to sort of slowly and steadily move throughout their environment by the so-called gliding motility. And what's interesting about this is we don't quite know for sure exactly how this works. It's not due to flagella, it's not due to cilia, uh, but again, we're just not, not quite sure of what molecular interactions are going on on the outer surface of these cells. A few comments about reproduction in bacteria. Uh, bacteria typically divide by binary fission. You might think of this as very similar to mitosis. A little different because bacteria don't have linear chromosomes like we do, but essentially they, they do have a chromosome. It's, it's sort of a, it's illustrated in gray in this image. It's kind of a large circular uh, chromosome. So essentially by binary fission, the genetic material must replicate, followed by division of the entire cell itself. We can also have this process of conjugation, whereby two cells come together and they form this conjugation tube between the two cells. And what can happen during conjugation is that the plasmid of one cell can be replicated and then donated to the adjacent cell. Finally, I'll mention 
uh, regarding reproduction, the fact that many bacteria can produce endospores. So this micrograph we see here is a section through a bacterial cell, and you notice this large structure inside the cell. You might be tempted to say, well, that's a nucleus, but no, recall that bacteria don't produce nuclei. What that is, essentially, the, the DNA of this bacterium is now walled off, and it formed this very resistant structure we call an endospore. What about interactions with other organisms? These are basic concepts that will come up many, many times over and over and over again, but we'll introduce them here with bacteria. So this idea of symbiotic relationships. So whenever we have two or more species living in close uh, contact with each other, for example, we can have mutualistic symbiotic relationships. Whenever we have mutualism taking place, this essentially refers to the fact that both species involved somehow benefit. So, for example, think about the plants that are known as legumes. Beans, peas, uh, peanuts. These are all plants that have nodules on the surface of their roots. If you slice through those nodules, what you're going to see is that they are loaded with cyanobacteria. These are cyanobacteria that can fix nitrogen. That is, convert nitrogen in the atmosphere to a form that is usable by the plant. So the plant benefits, and also the cyanobacteria benefit as well. Because think about the plant, it's photosynthesizing, transporting sugars down through its stem into its roots. So the cyanobacteria get a source of nutrients as well. So the point is both species benefit from this relationship. In contrast, we can talk about commensalism. This essentially refers to the basic idea whereby you have two or more species living clo closely together. One species benefits, but the other species doesn't necessarily benefit, but it's not harmed either. The other extreme would be parasitism. This is a situation where one species benefits at the expense of, an, of the other species. So this, of course, leads to a brief discussion of disease. A few comments about Robert Koch. Uh, Robert Koch uh, eventually won the Nobel Prize for some of his work. He was working back in the 1800s. He was studying anthrax, cholera, uh, tuberculosis, and essentially what he did was he figured out a, a, a system whereby we can connect specific diseases with the organisms that cause those diseases. So he essentially worked, worked out these so-called Koch's postulates that we can use to identify the causative agents of certain diseases. So essentially, he said, we have to find the same germ in every diseased individual. Also, you should be able to isolate the germ from a sick individual. It could be from a person or it could be from an animal. But I, I, I isolate the germ from a sick individual and grow it in culture. And then you should be able to take that culture, add it to an otherwise healthy individual, and induce the same sickness in that individual. Then you should be able to take that sick individual and isolate the same germ that was used to infect that individual. So again, it's just a series of steps which, which might make, make sense, sort of intuitive if you think about it these days. But again, he was one who first worked these out, and so this was a big deal at the time. And again, he eventually won the Nobel Prize in part for his work on disease. That concludes our brief discussion of bacteria.